Jim, Tony Khan had a media scrum after the AEW pay-per-view event. We're not going to play a ton of audio from this, but... There well, was... you know how I feel about that, don't you? All right, you think it's ding? I think it's great. Jim, a lot of the listeners have sent in two specific questions, so let me go to the timestamp here. This is a question that was asked of Tony about the creative process in AEW. We've had a lot of questions about this. We've heard a lot of things about it. Let's find out what exactly the creative process is. Stop it whenever you want. Hi, Tony. Neil Flanagan from Post Wrestling. I wanted to ask you something about the uh, creative process in AEW. And I, I know that you're not going to pull the curtain back altogether on this, but sure. uh, I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, I think one of the uh, common themes of All In 2024 has been it's been better received, I believe, in the build, the feud building, the storytelling. And I wonder, have you, is, there a, is there any kind of change in your outlook on this? I mean, in your media call on Thursday, you did mention the kind of the input that went into the Women's World title program, for oh. example. And I think throughout the card, it was seen this year, possibly more so than last year. Um, you're the co-owner. What is this cooker. question? <laughs> what is this fucking question? All right, well, let's go to Tony's nodding and uh, smiling the whole time. So he's having a good time here. You know, who else is involved in this? Is it RJ? Is it Chris Daniels? Is it Jimmy Jacobs? You know, can you, can you? There's open? like 27 people involved in the process. And it's like a football team. When I go in and I like, I'm at a football meeting where there's like, a lot of people contributing ideas and you have like a dozen coaches on offense and a dozen coaches on defense and everybody puts something in. And at the end of the day, I have to decide and I get pitched hundreds and hundreds of ideas a week and I can do less than half of them. And some of them are great ideas that just don't make you sense. Cause you'd need somebody else that somebody else had a better idea for so or that we were already pretty far down the line with. And it's like a big map and I get pitched hundreds of things. Um, let me stop there for a oh, moment. Oh, yeah, to get I was about to say, I've, I'm just, I'm zoning out here at the, my jaw open, but there may be a bunch of people pitching ideas at a football meeting amongst all the football coaches. I've never been to one of those. And maybe that is necessary there, but Brian, did 27 people ever write a great murder mystery? Did 27 people ever write an Oscar-winning movie? Did 27 people ever write a hit record? It you well, maybe more, that maybe that some of those Beyonce songs have like 50 fucking writers. I don't know what's going oh, on. Oh come on! But uh, yeah, the, the I have found traditionally and historically the more people that were involved in creative the worse the creative was because the less continuity and the less sense it makes and the less balance it has. And you can't get 27 people to agree on any goddamn thing. And then it's just a mess. It's just a cacophony. There has to be a, a Tarantino or a Spielberg or somebody at the top of this thing going, Coco do the uh, minions work it out. He's making it all about, and we'll go back to the rest of the audio here, all about the idea that people are pitching him these ideas. There are hundreds of ideas coming in a week. He could do less than half of them, he said. 27 people was the number he said that helped him with the show. When you were booking, how much of your booking was you coming up with an idea, honing in on an idea, or hearing something and finding a way to do it your own way versus people coming up to you nonstop pitching things? And is that, just well, a, is that just something any wrestling booker or promoter is going to deal with nonstop pitching? Uh, no, I did, I did not encourage. <laughs> I didn't encourage the nonstop pitching. In Smoky Mountain, you know, yes, there were like uh, Horner and White Boy wanted to do the, the angle they'd done in Alabama. Or Kevin Sullivan would pitch some ideas. And Dr. Tom would say something every now and then. Or, or Tony and Tracy Smothers. But it wasn't like people weren't trying to lobby me pitch ideas to get on the card because they were already on the card. 
and they weren't trying to get in the main event because they were making the same amount of money either way. And all of my guys really were main eventers at, at some level or another in terms of our roster. They were all recognized. So there wasn't a ton of, Oh, can I do this? Can I do that? And they weren't people that were trying to change their gimmick and find themselves because they, they were established names, except when I would bring in a, a, a rookie like Chris Candido who did kind of metamorphosize over time, over a few years, as he got older and more experienced, or, you know, uh, that type of thing. And in OVW, there, there were, sometimes there were ideas pitched, or I've mentioned the, the Heartbreakers would go out and they shot their own videos. And other guys would bring in something and they'd have ideas for their presentation for, you know, the way that they looked or a new, you know, something to set them apart. But they weren't nonstop pitching ideas because, let's face it, they were in wrestling school and I'd had 15 years experience. So are they going to really pitch me a lot of shit? And then, as a matter of fact, they'd be pitching me a lot of shit. But some, and the, then, the guys on the card on the bottom at OVW just happy to be on the card. The guys in the main events, they're not only pitching ideas just for a, a spots or a promo or whatever about this, but I would take what they were doing in their matches, what they were saying in their promos, and I would have ideas for them that they could polish up. I, I love the thing you're doing here, this move, or the way you do that. Do more of that. Work shit around that. You can get some heat with that. Or the thing you said, or when you guys do it, whatever. I just give them a little encouragement on shit they were already doing and so that they could develop shit. But it wasn't like there's a hundred guys around. This has never happened before before modern times and the WWE and AEW where there's a hundred guys and they're all pitching ideas to the writers because they're not on TV at all. Or they want to be on TV more. We had to use everybody. See what I'm saying? It wasn't like there's just this whole entire bench of people that are just waiting around for an idea of how to unleash them on the world. Everybody was in the program. They were just trying to be more involved and more featured. Well, let's go back to this audio here, Jim. I, I forgot we had more audio. More on Tony Khan, or not more on Tony, excuse me. Tony Khan with more, more on... More on Tony Khan. <laughs> Tony Khan with more about the creative process in AEW. Let's go to this. If I, you know, I have to decide. So, but that's a lot like other sports. You know, this is a sport. And that's something I've been trying to like hammer into the people is like when people tell me I've said that a lot this weekend, people tell me they're going to try to do something. And I say that's wouldn't fly. And that doesn't fly because this is a sport. And like, if I was at Fulham and the captain of the team told me, I'm going to try to do that for you. Like I've never heard that. And this is my ninth season as a sporting director. And not one person has ever told me that this is my 13th season as a professional sports executive and in other sports, nobody's ever told me I'm going to try to do something like, wait a minute. Nobody has ever told him in 13 years, I'm going to try to do something. What is he saying here? Now, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. I think he's saying it more like it's, uh, you know, it's not about try, it's about do. But on the other hand, it raises the question, do guys not feel comfortable asking or saying that to him? I'll try to do this. Do they feel they, they have to say, yes, sir? No, sir. Of course. We'll God damn it. Go out and win the world pole vaulting record. Okay, or I'll try. I mean, what... <sighs> That's just an odd, an odd thing to... Uh, yeah, because he said lots of guys came up to me earlier today and said they will try to do something. And I said, don't try. No one says try in any of my well, other athletic Well, besides endeavors. that, how is it like a, a, any other real sport, as he was saying, is it a sport like any other sport, when they're trying to make you believe they're pouring gasoline on somebody and going to set them on fire? But go ahead. I can do it. And like, uh, so... Like, uh, like that's how it works. And like in other sports and in this sport, like that's the whole point of having a head coach. Like, and there's lots of ideas. And the cool part is we have like, 
like I said, there's probably 27, 30 people in any given week that will come in with different ideas, <sighs> trying to contribute to different parts of the thing. And it's like in football where you have like, you have your quarterback coach, your running back coach, your wide receivers coach, your tight ends coach, your offensive line coach, your assistant offensive line coach, your assistant uh, offensive, you know, different people that are focused in different areas. And so I've got some people that might work with other people more than others. So like, you know, Jen would work with Mercedes, but she might work on promos with other people that she has a good rapport with. Uh, you know, I've put together, like I said, I'd come up with ideas for RJ and, or excuse me, I'd come up with ideas for uh, Tony and Mariah. And none of the coaches I had were really good for it because none of them understood what the fuck I was talking about. And everybody... What he's saying there is Wait a cl classic movies. He's talking about classic films. RJ City apparently was the only person there who has ever watched a black and white film. Oh, Christ, on a cracker. And also, he, he said that his coaches, in other words, the ex-wrestlers, the producers, the agents or whatever, they have no idea what I'm talking about. There might be a reason for that. Dustin, come here. Let's talk about Sunset Boulevard. What? <laughs> he was looking at me like all about even Sunset Boulevard. Like, what do you want me to do? Uh, and like, uh, so there was only one person in the back that even like knew the references. So like, that's how RJ got involved in the creative process. And he does a good job on things. Uh, Jimmy is really good because Jimmy's the only person that goes to every show. I'm, I go to every show. There's nobody else in the company besides Jimmy missed maybe like two shows in the last year. But like, he probably has the best attendance record of... Certainly anybody in the back office and almost anybody wait in the a entire minute, company. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? Hold on. Jimmy Jacobs shows up. That's big. Well, no, but uh, more importantly, who's not showing up? They <laughs> they have two days of taping a week. I, I, how is it allowed that the agents, the producers, the creative team members, they're not there at all of them? God damn, I... I even when I had very little, if anything, to do when I was on the way to moving to back to Louisville in 99 and finishing up the office duties in Stamford, I had to ask JR specifically if I could not go to television because I'm only going to be here for another three weeks anyway. Every... I, if you work for Vince McMahon on the creative team or you're an agent or whatever... Every time that they were putting something on tape, you were fucking there. And I mean, that's for years at a time. I I can't remember from February of 96 to past February of 99 that I ever missed a TV taping or a pay-per-view. Ever. Sick, well, weather catastrophes, whatever the case. And I, I, these people just come when they want to. Well, again, let's go back to this. He's talking about Jimmy Jacobs in the office. So, like, just to have a stenographer and, like, one person that's hearing everything, people come in and say, Jimmy will contribute some ideas, but he gets way too much shit online because people think Jimmy's putting this in, that, in, that. He's not putting a lot of stuff in. He's really good because he's, like, the guy that's there every week. He's not biased on anybody's stuff or in towards any one person. He has done a lot of stuff with Chris over the years, but it's not like Jimmy is the one t saying what we put in with Chris's stuff because I deal with Chris every week. So then Too many fucking first names. Who's Chris? Jericho. So who do we blame oh, for Jericho? Was... Jimmy Jacobs or Tony Khan? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> and, like, uh, and so it's like a big thing. We have this really, really good group of people. But at the end of the day, it's like a it's like a football team, and like on deep, and then going into defense, and then it's like you have the, the other locker room, and you have like it's in one locker room, but it's, you know two halftime, you're in one side or the other side, or in the special team specialist. <laughs> oh, Jesus and Christ! There's some people from each stop. group that go over to those meetings too. Just stop! So, just stop! Okay. Just I'm, no, I'm telling him just stop talking. <laughs> just stop talking. It, it's a lot like a sports team, but uh, yet there's certainly elements of acting and entertainment and show business to it. And that's how, when I get asked like yesterday in the dressing room at Fulham, when the players ask about the wrestling and a lot of them were here and Marco was here, which is really cool. Would have Marco Silva here. He's doing such a great job at Fulham. Marco and, Polo? You know, Who is Marco Polo? No, Marco Silva. Okay. Who's he? He must be with Fulham. Well, uh, Tony's certainly full of himself. Go ahead with him and uh we're in our fourth year working together and i think he's just so fantastic and it's so great that he would bring his family to this and uh 
So I really think that uh, what we've got, it's pretty cool. Uh, there's a number of other people that do a great job on other things too, like video, video packages, tying things together. And also a lot of it is the coaches. So you mentioned like Chris Daniels, uh, there's Sanjay Dutt, there's uh, Pat Buck, you know, in addition to the people I already mentioned, uh, Sarah Stock does a great job as a coach, Jerry Lynn, and, you know, about 10 others. Also, because we do, what's crazy is there's no off season. So it's 52 weeks a year. So like I said, it's it's a grind to make all the shows. I take a lot of pride in in doing the- It's a the grind Calvary to make all- Wait, and- ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Wednesday night and Saturday night and once a month of pay-per-view. How is that a fucking grind? Jesus Christ. And there's there's more writers than there are wrestlers on the TV show. How? What kind of budget is he bleeding with all these people? And obviously none of them get to do their job the way they would do it because there's 20 other people running into them having double knockouts trying to do the same shit. It's insane. You don't take ideas from... You take ideas from everywhere. You do not give 27 different people access to cluttering your fucking head up. And again, it's a it's a movie. You have a writer, a director, a producer, and minions, and sometimes the writer and director are often the same guy, and the promoter is the producer, he's the money, and then you get people to do the music or the audio or the video, but you're it's, it's you, it's, you're controlling these things. And if you're just having a big free-for-all where everybody's pitching shit and you're just trying to sift it out and put it in a format, no wonder this thing's so schizophrenic. I apologize. I won't interrupt again. No, there's only a few more seconds for this, and then we have another question, but let's get to this. And, like, uh, in doing so, like I said, it's good to have, like, different people that are specialists, almost like in pro football or college football, where people focus on different things. I think this year it's helped because last year we had literally just launched collision. I frankly think it's an easier environment backstage at collision than it was a year ago to do things. I think it's a lot easier flow between the two shows than it was a year ago. I think the locker room is in a much better place than it was a year ago as evidenced by like when we came up here versus what happened here a year ago. And, <laughs> and like, and I think it's much easier job I have dealing. Cause I had to deal with the people on collision last year and it's a much easier meeting process to put the TV together than it was a year ago at this time too, if that makes sense. Uh, but- Let me stop it there yeah, for a second. That- Cause what I thought was going to be the next question actually is just him continuing on with this question. Well, that makes perfect sense because last year you had a brand new show with high hopes and started out with a big number called collision. And it had a major mainstream star to head it up. And this year you've managed to let all of the children that work for you run off all of the big names that are serious about drawing money and having a good product. So it's much easier to get along as long as you still continue to pay all those people, all the money that they're not earning. So he's taking a shot at punk there, but oh, it's uh, so much easier now. The only reason that there was a problem with collision last year was because it was a show designed to keep the biggest star in the company away from the fucking mealy mouth little whiners that didn't like him. And you put the biggest star in the company on the new show on Saturday night that was not going to draw the viewership of the flagship show and then fired him so that now nobody watches Saturday night. So yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot less strife in his locker room. Now that everybody's making their money, nobody has to, work with people they don't want to work with. And Tony's still losing a fortune, but he doesn't care because he's having fun. Just another few seconds to this, and then we'll uh, wrap this up. Because we were obviously dealing with a lot of things going into Wembley last year, which obviously showed up. And like, uh, but today was, I thought, the most spectacular day I've ever had. And I was saying to Brian... Yes? And we don't know what Brian has to say Wednesday, and we don't know what's to come of this but there's some uncertainty 
going into Brian's future to say the least. And you have the AEW world champion and somebody I personally, I, you know, I care so much about and you have two people in Brian and sting and I wouldn't have said it, but Brian said it right before he walked out that I dragged him kicking and screaming to this point because I, it was like with sting. These are the two most unselfish people in the history of the sport the two most selfless people and in the same calendar year to be able to sit here next to sting retiring as an undefeated world champion after putting in the best three-year run he could have possibly had to close out his career and redefining stings legacy somebody i grew up watching since i was a little boy before the first time i ever saw a wrestling match in person i was watching sting on tv on tbs and to be able to put sting on tbs and send him off the right way and and make sure well i'll stop it here uh he, gee i was about to say is it two o'clock in the morning there yet uh it may be now yes it may and be. he hadn't slowed down no you know again they had the incident earlier in the night where jack perry had the glass moment and i got the fans going and naturally everyone noticed what that was and the significance of the uh you know of the symbolism actually i guess you should say and now here's tony making a little comments about things a year ago. Any co any issue with any of this? Is it worth it doing it now? Or is this a way for all these guys to put this all to bed and move on? What do you think? No, they'll never put it to bed. They'll never they can't get over it. They're still talking about it. And that's the thing. They they've had a two-hour pre-show, a four-hour main show, and now they're doing a media scrum past midnight in London. And Tony is spending his time droning on and on about how great everything is, but also having to make sure that everybody knows, well, you know, once we got rid of that, uh, the, the problem or whatever, it's so much easier now. They just love to talk. They just love to, and we're talk radio hosts, right? But that's our job. It is not Tony Khan's job to sit there and talk for hours about how great everything is, he thinks. After fucking midnight, when they've already had hours and hours to show everybody how great everything is, it's j they're all marks for themselves. They are convinced they are superstars. And God damn, at least shut up once in a while. And maybe put him on a, a midnight curfew. You can't talk after midnight, Tony. Give us eight hours. You can't talk till the sun comes up. Well, that was Tony Khan talking until the sun came up at the AEW All-In Media Scrum.